Hi, Professor Deborah. Are you okay? Welcome. To hello, hello. Welcome. Hello, Professor. Hello, how are you, Cormac? I'm very well, thank you. Oh, thank nice you. to meet you. Nice to meet you. How are you, Mariana? <laughs> Fine. Yeah. Oh. I'm thank a big you. fan of you, Cormac. I read your book. Oh, okay. thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. It's a very touching message. Yes, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so there's, um, did you read the, the English edition? The English edition in Kindle. The Kindle. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. you. It's, it's, it's very nice always to meet somebody. It's, it's, um, it's nice how it spreads and I don't know where it goes, but I meet very nice people as a result of it. <laughs> yes, thank you. I think it's an edition from 2011, I think. Mm, okay, the second yeah. edition, yeah. It's here. <laughs> this book started a revolution. Yes. We have to talk about it. Yeah, thank you. I think I'm more revolutionary at heart than a lawyer. <laughs> Uh, Mariana, has already everyone tested their microphones, cameras, etc.? Okay. Has everyone did yes, that? It's important. Yeah. Because I saw that, uh, yeah, Professor Cormac, okay, Deborah, okay. Vladimir is not, uh, doesn't have a picture. And has Fernanda replied or not? Not yet. So I, I believe it's better to, to start then. So. So I'll just make the announcements in Portuguese, then I go on English. I believe this is the okay. better way to go. Good idea. Yeah. Oi, boa tarde, Sinara. Oi, professora Débora, como vai? Tudo bem? Prazer em revê-la. Jonathan, you can start uh, when you want. Fernanda uh, will not be with us today. Okay. She had a problem. Yeah, no problem. So, uh, yeah. So, posso já estou na tela? Yes. Aí se você fala, você entra na tela. Não, beleza. Então. Okay. Sorry. My bad. Um, dois, Hi, três, então. Ah, oh, so now Vladimir has entered. Hi, Vladimir. How are you? Welcome, Professor Vladimir. Welcome here. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. everything fine, and the picture is perfect, so no worries. All right, uh, let's go. As Vladimir, so eu vou falar em português rapidinho. Uh, eu vou abrir em português falar só os anúncios, aí, eu, aí depois eu começo em inglês e aí a gente faz a mesa toda em inglês. Beleza? Okay. Só dá, é, também faz uma saudação à professora Débora, né? a Sinara, né? e good afternoon, 
Mr. Kulina. Vamos que vamos, então. Eu estou na tela, imagino. Olá a todas e todos, eu sou Jonathan Barros Vita, coordenador e professor titular do mestrado e doutorado em Direito do PPGD Unimar, Programa de Pós-Graduação em Direito da Universidade de Marília. E é com muito prazer que é, a gente continua às terças-feiras. Agora, eu acho que é a última edição de férias, né, Mariana? Então, é, a gente tá, teve um hiato aí em que o projeto da professora Mariana e o meu projeto das sextas-feiras ficaram no período de férias, só que as aulas da Unimar retornaram, né? E a gente tem, inclusive, grandes e interessantes novidades aí desse período pandêmico, porque é, a professora Mariana foi convidada é, pelo pessoal, é, é, pelos professores da Colômbia para fazer em cotutela uma disciplina da Unimar e da Colômbia, que vai ser a disciplina da professora Mariana para os alunos do próximo semestre. Então, os alunos do mestrado que entraram no período... 2020-02, vão poder justamente fazer essa disciplina que é dada em cotutela de maneira internacional. E os outros alunos do programa, não se preocupem que vocês não vão ficar órfãos, nem os, órfãos, nem os alunos do mestrado, nem os alunos do doutorado, porque é, a gente vai ter a possibilidade de que todos os alunos da Unimar participem e recebam aí como curso de curta duração ministrado de novo, em Cotutela, Brasil, Colômbia. Então, acho que essa é uma grande oportunidade, a gente realmente tem aproveitado, é, a gente tem aproveitado esse período para fazer aquilo que a universidade pode fazer de melhor, que é fazer projetos que engrandeçam a sociedade e que, de fato, é, permitam essa troca entre sociedade e universidade. Então, feito esse aviso, não se preocupem, alunos, todos vocês vão receber as comunicações formais, mas era um, um anúncio que acho bastante, bastante interessante, digamos assim, e importante dizer. Então, a partir de agora, eu vou falar em inglês, e aí a gente é, faz todo o evento em inglês, que esse é mais um evento também de internacionalização. Dessa vez, a gente está é, é, com a Universidade de Cape Town, então, acho que vamos ter aí elementos bastante interessantes com os nossos convidados, o professor Vladimir, que também é habituê e parceiro do programa, né? E a professora Débora também, e, enfim, capitaneados aí pela Mariana e sempre com assistência positiva da Sinara. So, hi everyone, uh, as stated before, my name is Jonathan Barros Vita, for who doesn't speak Portuguese, and I'm the director and professor of the PhD and master's program of University of Marília, Unimar. And it's really a pleasure to receive Professor uh, Cormac Cullinan from University of Cape Town, who is really well known on the academic environment and always on the, the project that is harmony with nature. So therefore, I believe that we will have great debates because we have really great friends of the program and of myself obviously professor vladimir from university uh, federal university of uh, mato grosso do sul and professor deborah uh, who is from my alma mater from the postgraduate program of PUC sao paulo so and um, always we have the firm hand steering us which is the firm hand of professor mariana alongside with Professor Sinara, who is always helping us here. So everyone is really welcome. So don't forget to subscribe on the channel, uh, click uh, thumbs up on the video, and for sure we will have excellent debates. And today is always a special day for us. And bear in mind that we have a full program in our channel today and also on Friday. So today at 6 p.m. we have some lectures regarding uh, methodology from the project of Professor Walter and Carlos. And Friday we have the continuation of the discussions on, ta on Brazilian tax reform, which is a project that I uh, spearhead. And we will have uh, Professor Leonel from FGV Sao Paulo, uh, Leonor Vieira from also PUC Sao Paulo, and Stael Freire, 
uh, who is from, uh, uh, she is from Piauí, but she's all over the place talking about Brazilian simple tax system. So I'm really glad that we have so many events and great things coming this week on the channel of Unimar. Welcome everyone. Mariana. Thank you, Jonathan. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, for those who don't know me yet, my name is Mariana Santiago and I am professor of the postgraduate program at the University of Marilia. I hope you all are well and safe in these difficult times that we are living because of the pandemic. Uh, we will start now our weekly event titled Dialogues on Development, Company and Society. It's an event organized by University of Marilia uh, for our students, but it's now completely open to all our community. I see that we have with us today students and professors from different places in Brazil, from different uh, universities. So welcome everybody. It is a pleasure today to have with us uh, Dr. Cormac Cullinan from South Africa. He is director of South Africa's oldest specialist environmental law firm. And he has worked in more than 20 countries and has drafted a range of environmental treaties, legislation, and policies, including the amazing Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth, which has proclaimed on 22 April 2010 in Bolivia. His, uh, his groundbreaking book, Wild Law, has played an important role in inspiring our international movement. Uh, the Chinese edition of White Law was selected as one of the top 10 good books in China in 2017. Uh, he's also part of the United Nations project called Harmony with Nature. My students already know what it is because of my classes, because uh, um, I I'm proud to be part of this too. Uh, his lecture, Professor Cullinan's lecture will be uh, also about earth jurisprudence and laws as a technique for adapting the, uh, to enver environmental change. Uh, the subject is extremely important and it's in line with what we work at the University of Marilia. I would like to mention the presence today with us of Professor Dr. Deborah Lamba from Catholic University of Sao Paulo, one of the most important universities in Brazil it's an honor. Uh, welcome, Professor Deborah and Professor Dr. Vladimir Oliveira, also from Catholic University of Sao Paulo and Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul. Uh, welcome, Professor Vladimir. Uh, they will discuss the topic with us in a dialogue. Uh, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, I have to say thank you too to Professor uh, Marielena Diniz and her International Law Institute for supporting this event. Thank you, Professor Marilena Denise. So finally, um, I wish everyone a great experience. Uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Kuliman, feel free to start your lecture. We look forward to hearing you and thank you once again to be with us today. Thank you very much, Mariana, and thank you all um, for inviting me. It's, uh, it's lovely to be able to sit here in my office in Cape Town and speak to all of you in Brazil. And perhaps this is one of the, the good parts of the, of the pandemic. Um, but as you all know, we are living in a time of, of great change, a period of transition. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic that is now underway, but also the huge fires that we've seen in your country and other countries within the Amazon basin, in California, Australia, Africa, Scandinavia, severe droughts, hurricanes, the world is clearly in transition. The question is, a transition to what? We're not sure. It could be more authoritarianism. It could be more conflict. It could be more scarcity and, and famines. But it could also be a shift towards greater healing, towards restorative justice, towards regenerative agriculture and rewilding of a, a land that has been abandoned and perhaps greater community solidarity. But I want to speak to you today about law and governance. And in particular, 
why I think that the legal systems of almost all states are part of the problem. And that instead of helping us to survive in this changing environment, they are making it less likely for us to survive. In other words, from an evolutionary perspective, they are maladaptive, they are not good for us. I will also speak about how changing laws and governance systems could improve our prospects of survival. Now, as you will all know, um, Darwin's theory of evolution proposed that when the environment changes, those species that are best adapted to cope with the new conditions will thrive, and those that are not well adapted may, will not do well and may go extinct. This process of natural selection is sometimes referred to as the survival of the fittest. But what Darwin meant by survival of the fittest is often misunderstood. The fitness does not refer to the organism's strength or athletic ability, but rather the ability to survive and to reproduce. So Darwin, as you know, Darwin's theory of evolution is based on the idea that in any population is a degree of genetic variation, which means that some uh, individuals are better adapted to the environment than others, um, which means that those individuals are more likely to survive and more likely to reproduce. And over time, because more of their offsprings will survive, eventually the whole population changes and it may evolve even into a different species or, or number of different species. However, the ability of humans to survive and reproduce is determined not only by genetics, but also by culture. That includes cultural beliefs about how the universe functions and um, how cultures also structure societies and how they govern themselves. So we also have to consider the question of cultural adaptation. So cultural evolutionary evolution theory has adapted the biological definition of adaptation or survival of the fittest um, by drawing attention to the fact that human behavior and how we adapt to our environment is shaped by two co-evolving systems of inheritance. So on the one hand, we inherit genes from our ancestors. So that is the biological inheritance. And on the other hand, we inherit beliefs and practices which are passed on to us by our culture, and they also shape our behavior. Now, individuals can, of course, uh, choose to reject or modify the beliefs of their own culture. And typically, a society will include a number of subcultures, which are different. So it's not entirely homogenous, but um, it is nevertheless a very strong factor. And you can see this because although all humans have very similar genes, there is a very great diversity of, of human behavior that has allowed humans to live successfully in a very wide range of habitats. From the Arctic to the deserts, you will find humans and they have adapted well. And that is because to a large degree due to cultural adaptations. And this involves the uh, accumulation of information and skills over many generations and its transmission to younger people. So it involves, if, if you like, transmitting more um, information than one person could accumulate in their lifetime. Now, it's not difficult to see that in changing times, some societies are likely to cope better than others because their culture enables them to adapt more successfully to the changed circumstances. And consequently, their citizens are more likely to flourish. Indeed, at the moment, it's, it's quite interesting to observe how different societies are responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it may be an oversimplification, but the societies that, most of the societies that appear to have responded most successfully are democratic societies with women leaders. And those societies with the more macho political culture or, or macho ruling party appear to have been less successful and in some cases a far greater proportion of their citizens have died. 
So that is perhaps partially to do with leadership, but partially, possibly partially to do with culture, culture as well. And clearly culture plays an important role in how societies are responding to climate change. For example, in the United States of America, there are far more climate change deniers, people who don't believe in climate change than in most countries, because it has been turned into a party political issue. In other words, many Republicans um, regard climate change as some kind of hoax, some kind of fake news, which is perpetuated by the Democratic Party and their allies for political purposes. So what I'm arguing is that just as those, in the same way that those people who attend uh, Trump rallies without masks are reducing their prospects of survival in the short term, so those who choose not to believe in climate change are re reducing the survival prospects of young people and of future generations. In other words, your beliefs, your cultural beliefs um, have a direct uh, role to play in how you behave and how um, and your prospects of, of survival. But cultures also develop and structure societies and communities. So an individual is born into a, a structured social environment. And law is one of the key tools used to constitute and structure societies and also to um, embed or establish and enforce norms of behavior. So the law says this behavior is socially acceptable and this behavior is antisocial and maybe a crime, for example. So a constitution will typically express a society's idea of itself and what it aspires to be. And it will also define fundamental rights, uh, particularly human rights, normally human rights. It will also define how the legislature, the judiciary and the executive arm of government will be appointed and how they will function. So the constitution and the laws that implement the constitution also determine how power is exercised in society and how decisions are made and enforced. So it's easy to see that law plays a very important structuring role in society. And it also plays a major role in determining how change in society occurs. Law typically plays a conservative role in that it slows the pace of change and it channels it in particular ways. For example, the legal system may require that political change can only occur as a consequence of a democratic election, say every four years. Um, it may also require that other significant social changes can only occur as a consequence of changing the law. Another, so it, in, in this way, um, law functions a bit like the DNA of a society because it determines how, how the society replicates itself. So in the same way as the DNA of an organism um, determines the structure of the organism and how it grows, um, so law in many, in many ways plays a similar role in, in shaping how societies grow and change over, over time. Um, now, given the central role played by law and legal philosophies, in other words, jurisprudence, um, it seems reasonable to assume that the nature of the legal system could play a very important role or does play a very important role in shaping both the extent to which the society degrades the environment and how it responds to a changing environment. So it's both affecting the extent to which we're causing the environmental problems and shaping how we respond to them. So what, what would make a, a legal system adaptive? In other words, a legal system help us to survive, more fit to survive, um, as opposed to maladaptive? Well, there are many different factors I think one could come up with, but I, I'm just going to suggest four for the purposes of this, this, the talk today. So I, I would suggest that a legal system that is based on an accurate understanding of the world will be more successful and more adaptive um, than one which is, sees the world through a, a worldview that is distorting. In other words, it's like looking 
through a, a, an inaccurate lens in, in glasses, which, which distorts that. In other words, the more accurate one's understanding of the world and the more accurately the law, the legal system reflects that, the more likely it is to be adaptive. Um, secondly, I think a belief that the laws of nature are relevant and should be taken into consideration in designing laws and governance systems um, is a factor which would make the system more adaptive. So a system that doesn't believe that laws of nature are relevant um, would be maladaptive. Thirdly, a belief that systems of governing people should be designed to ensure that the people respect the laws of nature and live harmoniously within the earth community is likely to be more adaptive. Um, by this, for example, a, a legal system which reflects principles or ideas such as live and let live, that everything has its place, that everything that has come into being has the right to be an, an inclusive um, uh, worldview, if, if you like, is more likely uh, to be adaptive, I would suggest. And fourthly, a characteristic um, which would make a legal system more adaptive is the belief that the collective good must be prioritized over individual, narrow individual, sectoral or species specific interests. In other words, taking a more holistic approach is likely um, to be more adaptive. Okay, so having talked a bit about what we think would, would make a legal system um, help us to be, uh, to help us to survive, let's look quickly at the characteristics of the dominant of the legal systems that dominate the world at the moment. So we, if we look at the dominant cultures, and this is really most, most states in the world today, um, the legal systems, I think, are based on a scientifically incorrect mechanistic understanding of the nature of the universe. In other words, at the time of the so-called Age of Enlightenment in Europe, in the 17th and 18th centuries, it was believed that the universe functioned like a giant clock, like a mechanism, um, and that one simply had to take it apart, understand how it works, and then human beings could manipulate nature for their own advantage. And this is reflected in the legal systems, for example, in our legal systems, only people um, and corporations are subjects of law. Only they may hold legal rights. Everything else, everything in nature is, is property. Um, it's a thing. Now, that would, be, that would be appropriate if the world actually was a mechanism. In other words, if one was dealing with the cogs of a clock or some kind of mechanism, and we humans were the only um, people, subjects, manipulating this clock, it would make sense that we were the only legal subjects and everything else was mechanism, was object, um, was property. But of course, we now know that that is a very inaccurate um, understanding of the world, and the scientists and ecologists have long since abandoned it, but unfortunately, it's been hardwired into our legal systems and hasn't changed. Now, the idea that everything that is not a human being um, is a thing, is property, is analogous, uh, similar to the idea of slavery. So with slavery, as you know, some human beings were defined as slaves who were property, in other words, and could be bought and sold. And others were, other humans were slave owners who had full rights. Now, it's very easy to see that when you set your legal system up that way, the slave owner with all the rights will exploit the slave. Um, in other words, the system is designed to enable and legitimize an exploitative relationship between the slave owner and the slave. And that is the, exactly the same relationship which our legal systems have established between humans and corporations on the one hand as rights holders, and all of nature on the other hand, which is property and, and, and has no rights in the eyes of the law. So it's not uh, a mistake that, the, that nature gets up, ends up being overexploited and degraded. The system is designed to work that way. Now, um, in my view, this reflects a, a colonial attitude in relation to earth. Um, by that, I mean that um, 
we humans, and I say we humans, it's not all humans, humans that are part of industrialized cultures, um, uh, our predominant attitude to earth is that we want to dominate, control, extract, and manipulate nature and earth. So we, we focus on our rights to, to take rather than our duties to respect life and to play our part in enabling life to flourish. Our legal systems tend to be transcend, transcendent, not grounded. By that, I mean that we are guided by abstract notions rather than the lived reality of, of being organic creatures on this earth. So for example, profits and carbon credits are more important than life itself. And these are very abstract concepts. So as a result of this, for example, the idea of building massive solar reflectors in space to deflect the sunlight away from the earth, so called geoengineering, is taken seriously as a potential response to climate change instead of restoring the soils, which is down to earth. So nature solved the problem of, of greenhouse gases and too much carbon in the atmosphere many, many millions of years ago. The earth sequestrates, holds carbon in its body, in its soil, and carbon is held in plants and soils. It's held under the seas and in the frozen tundra. Um, it's we who've come and dug it up and put it back into the, the atmosphere causing the problem. So the, the solutions are about going back to earth and working with nature, not uh, extending the project of domination and control further. Our legal systems also don't have a good understanding of the context. In other words, they don't take account of the fact that we exist within an ordered universe and that our systems of order are subsystems of a greater system of order. In other words, there's a complete disconnect between law and science, because if we really listen to science, our laws would restrain human actions that risk us to transgress planetary boundaries. Um, and this, the, the failure of law in this regard is shown um, when one looks at the key challenges of the 20th and 21st century. For example, catastrophic climate change is upon us now. Um, and the decline in wild species, including insects, has been catastrophic. Um, for example, the world, the world Wildlife Fund's Living Planet Report, published this month, says that the average population of nearly 4,400 mammals, amphibians, birds, fish, and reptiles has dropped by 68% since 1970. So that's well within my lifetime. Um, and uh, more than 10 years ago, the, the parties to the Convention on Biological, Biological Diversity adopted targets in Aichi in Japan to stop this um, loss of biodiversity. But earlier this month, a report came out which confirmed that not one of those targets had been met in the last 10 years. So why is law being so ineffective in dealing with the most important challenges of our times? Well, the law is not, the existing laws are not affecting what is driving this destruction. For example, the colonial extractivist mindset that understanding of the world is still intact. The financial incentives to destroy life have not been affected. And the laws that authorize these destructive activities are unchanged. So in short, causing climate change is legal. Almost all the activities that cause climate change are perfectly legal. Um, and so are many of the activities um, which uh, destroy biodiversity, such as cutting down forests and burning them. In, in my country, the farming of lions to be killed in fake hunts by egotistical trophy hunters, or to be slaughtered so that their bones can be sold um, in China and Vietnam as, as tiger bones, is legal. Now, these are clearly activities which are, are, are not uh, 
uh, consistent with being a good citizen of the earth, a good member of the earth community. So although this might seem very obvious, why don't, why don't we see this? Because in many ways it should be very obvious. Well, I, I think that we are blinded by, by our arrogance, by our belief that we humans are exceptional and that by this illusion that we are separate and superior to the rest of the community of life. And it, it reminds me very much of the apartheid system in South Africa where, where I grew up when I was growing up. A small section of the community, the white community, decided that they were um, superior to the rest of the community and they set up this political system called apartheid. Now apartheid in Afrikaans means separateness. It's the idea that it's a, it's a philosophy based on separation and superiority. And it was uh, an incredibly uh, cruel and disastrous um, um, human experiment, uh, which failed miserably and we still live with the consequences today. But that is the same kind of thinking that we humans, or particularly from, not from indigenous societies, but, but from many of the um, dominant societies, it's the same kind of thinking as we apply to other species. We see ourselves as separate from and superior to the community of life. Whereas the reality is that we can only flourish as part of that community. So the question is what to do? Um, well, I think, one of the things we should start with is coming back to ground, reconnecting with the earth. So I, th I often think that the first thing to, to do is to walk into nature, to breathe deeply and slowly and regain some sanity. Um, I find it interesting, for example, that the words for, for soil or humus, human and humility all share the same root. So part of our way back to being humans um, is to be humble and to reconnect with the soil. Secondly, we need to change our, our perception of the role of the human. We need to abandon the failed project of domination and control, which places us outside of the community of life. And in instead, we must embrace our membership of the community. We must look around us and realize that we have the most extraordinary gifts to contribute to this community of, of life um, and that we are incredibly lucky to have been born members of the most beautiful, intricate, amazing community that we have been able to find anywhere in the entire universe so far. Another thing we can do is take inspiration from Indigenous people because if one looks around the world, the earth does better in places where indigenous people make the decisions. Um, the, the, the intact ecosystems correspond to, to a high degree with where indigenous people have been able to retain their land rights. So we can learn from, the, from them. We also need to change the aspirations of society. Instead of profit, we, need, we should be aiming to contribute to the whole. We, I think if we could all aspire to leave the earth community better off um, when we die than it was when we, we were born. That would be a wonderful thing. We also need to change our governance systems. We need to change how decisions are made, how our values that inform those decisions and the information that informs those decisions and also who makes those decisions. Um, so I believe that Earth jurisprudence and the global movement for the rights of nature are a very important aspect of this. So I first wrote Wild Law um, 18 years ago. Now, that was the first book to use the to term Earth jurisprudence and to define it in its fundamental concepts. But it was based, um, I, I stood on the shoulders, if you like, of, of Thomas Berry, an, an amazing uh, Catholic monk, um, who had set out 10, what he called 10 points for the reform of jurisprudence. Um, and I also learned, of course, from my limited exposure uh, to indigenous cultures and from many other people. But in the book, I, I talk, I introduce the concept of the great jurisprudence. By that, I'd simply mean that there are certain characteristics of, of the universe 
that just are, which we have to accept, they are non-negotiable. If you put more than a certain amount of carbon uh, dioxide into the of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, um, it will destabilize it and change it. Uh, it's not something which one can negotiate at a treaty or extract concessions, it just is. So there's a concept, some people prefer to call it the great law, um, but indigenous people typically have a similar understanding that there are, there are uh, fundamental rules which govern the community of life. And the most important thing to do is to learn what they are and to follow them. Now, an earth jurisprudence really is a, a philosophy of law that tries to align human systems with the laws of nature, if you like, so that human beings can live as good citizens within the earth community. And the concept of the rights of nature is one of the tools which one can use to implement earth jurisprudence, although by no means the only tool. So now this, uh, the, the rights of nature movement itself was uh, um, given a, a great help in 2008 when Ecuador adopted a constitution which recognized the rights of nature. Um, this gave legitimacy and credibility to the idea because before then people have been saying this is a mad idea and it's impossible, you could never do it. But Ecuador ended that argument. It, it, it is clearly possible and now the issue is how to make it work and how well it works. This was followed in, in 2010 by the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth which came out of a, a, a People's World Conference in Cochabamba in Bolivia. And that was really important because it gave us a kind of a manifesto, a kind of a, a document that had popular legitimacy um, and around which we could unite. Um, and also in 2010, we then started the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature. You could call it an alliance of earth-loving peoples but what's important about the Global Alliance is that it is an alliance. It's not intended to be a super organization. It's intended to be a means of many organizations, communities who believe um, in this approach to collaborate and work together so that we can all be more effective. Um, and this, uh, the, 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 the global movement for the rights of nature has grown enormously and continues to grow very rapidly all over the world. Sometimes it just emerges spontaneously by itself in a, in a country. Sometimes people hear the ideas um, elsewhere. But indigenous people have, from all over the world have lent their support to it and have played a very important part in developing the ideas and also guiding it. And then, um, as, you, as you know, Mariana has talked about the United Nations Harmony with Nature program, which has been very important in this regard. And at the moment, um, the, the Global Alliance is working on a program of localizing and regionalizing, regionalizing the alliance. In other words, getting people um, to work locally and in, in regions around these ideas, um, because uh, we need, it's easier to organize that way and can be more effective. And one only needs to raise some issues up to the international level. So in conclusion, I'd, I'd like to just make a few uh, quick points. First of all, as I've said, the governance systems of almost all states, I believe, are maladaptive from an evolutionary point of view. In other words, they are making it less likely that their citizens will survive in this changing environment rather than more likely. Um, secondly, I believe that societies that aspire to live as good citizens within the Earth community um, and to live in harmony with nature, if you like, are less likely to make the problems worse and more likely to take the right decisions in responding to this changing world and the changing environment. Um, I think too that societies who change their governance systems to reflect this perspective, in other words, by adopting, for example, an earth jurisprudence approach, are more likely to succeed than those who try to continue dominating, exploiting, and managing nature. In other words, with the colonial mindset. So it, in conclusion, I'd like to say, if we're talking about adaptation and fitness to survive, there's no time to grow gills or wings or, or, or make the physical changes that have happened over millions of years in order to deal with the very different circumstances. 
uh, we have to make cultural adaptations and, and law and governance is central to it. So I urge you all to join the growing movement to change the purpose of our governance systems from domination and control and exploitation to participation um, in, in this most amazing community of life and to apply the earth jurisprudence approach where you can and encourage the implementation of laws that facilitate the flourishing of all life rather than its exploitation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Kulinan, uh, for your lecture. So brilliant and so sensitive. And uh, I'm sure uh, your presence with us today will invite our students to still fighting for our environmental change and a change that is so necessary in law area. Uh, and now I would like to hear uh, Professor Deborah Costa. Professor Deborah, okay. I'm here. <laughs> uh, can I Hello. start your presentation? Just let me know. Oh, okay, okay. Hey, you can put the slides on if you want to, yes. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's my honor and my privilege to be here today and to have the chance to dialogue with Professor Korma Kalinen, one of the most important, passionate and enthusiastic persons in favor of nature. I consider myself very lucky and honored. Thank you so much. But first of all, I would like to thank professors Maria Elena Diniz, Mariana Santiago, Jonathan Vita, Sinara Lacerda, and Professor Vladimir da Silveira for this great opportunity. And thank you so much, Professor Korma Kalinen, for your amazing presentation. I know that when we speak about nature, we have to speak from the heart. So. <laughs> I speak in English, it's not my mother language, but I'll try to speak from my heart. <laughs> uh, Mario Quintana said, books don't change the world, people do. Books only change people. Korma Kalinen, I must say that your book, your ideas, your amazing work had a great impact on me and motivated me to go deep into my thoughts. Your book is a manifesto that we must transform our societies if we are to turn away from the destruction of life on earth. Uh, my background is in law. I was a public attorney for more than 30 years. I certainly believe that laws are a powerful tool for transformation and you made it clear today. And yesterday, our president signed a law that criminalized the abandon and abuse of dogs and cats. It's a great victory for pets. Uh, although our legal system is based on an anthropocentric worldview, humans are the center and everything else is resource for us to use as commodities. Uh, our legal system is designed to facilitate and to legitimate the exploitation of natural resources. So that provokes an endless debate. A debate, for instance, to recognize non-human animals as subjects of rights, even to grant them personhood. Uh, Peter Singers insists on the protection of animal welfare Animals are sentient beings, they can suffer and feel pain. Uh, Gary Francione advocates the abolition of all animal exploitation. Animals are not servants or slaves of human beings, but have their own moral significance. And recent, recently, Will Kimlicka understands that animals support positive rights as citizenship. By looking ahead, we can expect more animals every year to be bred, confined, tortured, exploited, and killed to satisfy human desires. Charles Patterson was motivated to see the human-animal relations as what he called an eternal Treblinka. Treblinka is an allusion to the extermination camp built and operated by Nazi Germany 
in occupied Poland during World War II. And sadly, there is no sign that this relationship will be different. We are all connected on the internet. Each one of us is attached to a cell phone, a computer, social networks. We are all living in a technological world. And your alert, Professor Kaliman, is that, and I quote, below the shiny surface of our super wonder societies, our planet and our humanity is decaying. Have you ever looked into the bright, clear eyes of a child and tried to explain why the whales are being killed and forests burned? Why teenagers blow themselves up in the process of killing other children in the Middle East? Unquote. The pandemic calls for a paradigm shift. It is urgent to think about our reactions but mostly to understand that we are a communion of beings. We are part of this incredible community of life and our future could only be a happy one if we live in integrity and in solidarity with all beings. As you recall Thomas Berry, <laughs> Thomas Berry's alert should be a mantra. Earth is a communion of subjects not a collection of objects. We as lawyers and students of law cannot doubt that we too have the skills to change things, to transform the human communities in which we are members. And Professor Kuhlman, you are beyond question an important voice to be followed. Thank you so much. I lived uh, part of my childhood and teenage years in the south part of Brazil uh, very close to nature and animals, especially horses. I can call myself a passionate nature and animal lover. In the 70s, on a ranch in Nevada in the USA, we started equine therapy for kids that had Down syndrome. At that time, healing therapy with horses was very new to me. Although the relationship between humans and horses has a long history, it goes back thousands and thousands of years before Christ. And being involved with equine therapy was a unique experience for me. Uh, horses could be gentle to the kids, show them confidence and trust. Horses allow the kids to come closer. Mariana, we have a picture of the horses and the kids, I think, yes. <laughs> it's amazing, it's amazing work. Uh, horses allow the kids to come closer, pet them, give them carrots and sugar tablets. It is a special bond. I used to put sugar tablets uh, in my jacket pockets and the horses would gently grab them from me and the kids respond with a big, a great big smile. For the therapy, we rode Toro bred horses, Arabian horses, quarter mile horses, but one of the horses was almost impossible to ride. We couldn't break Catherine down. That's why we left her behind in the corral. Catherine was a Mustang mare. And at that time was a recent movement to protect Mustangs. An extraordinary woman called Wild Horse Annie whose name was Velma Johnston, had a campaign not only to save, protect, and control wild horses and burros of American West, but a campaign against a persuasive attitude in America that wild horses were nothing more than commodities. On what became public law in 9195, the Wild Free Roaming Horse and Burro Act of 1971 prohibited capture, injury, or disturbance of wild horses and burros. And if populations became too large, equines would be transferred to suitable areas where wild horses and burros belong. Now I have the understanding that Catherine should be free on her natural habitat 
on, so, on the so-called Wild West. She certainly didn't belong in a corral, but galloping in the vast plains of the American West. As a teenager, I had a limited comprehension of animal rights. But now I believe that it's necessary to shift the consciousness to the recognition that our well-being depends on us maintaining healthy relationship with members of the community, humans and other than humans, recognizing rights to all members of this marvelous community called Earth. I would say to restore our bonds. As Thomas Berry said, and I quote, rights come from existence. Rights is simply the giving to every being its due. That's a brief definition of rights. Every being to exist has three rights. The right to be, the right to habitat, and the right to fulfill its role in the great community of existence. A tree needs three rights. Birds need birds' rights. Plants need plants' rights. And children, for their just simple emotional and mental development, have the need to contact with the mountains, with the air, the sea, with the dawn, the sunset, the trees, the birds, the song of the birds. Unquote. And I might add, with horses. Ian McCallan poetry is an alert. Listen. Have we forgotten that wilderness is not a place, but a pattern of soul where every tree, every bird and beast is a soul maker? Have we forgotten that wilderness is not a place, but a season? And we are in its final hour. Poetry is a call. Books are an awakening, a powerful tool for change. Poetry is a language of protest, but it's also a language of hope. A poet's soul, a writer's soul, revealing words what is going on around us and what is going on around us. Uh, we have some pictures of what's going on in Pantanal here. It has the protection, this area has the protection in our constitution. We have more pictures, Mariana, we can show them. There is another one. I think this picture is just saying that we, we have to change. Another one, this is Tamanduá Bandeira. It's, uh, it's original from here. Another and another, we have two more, more one, one more, okay. And Guimarães Rosa emphasizes, Guimarães Rosa is a Brazilian writer and he said, if every animal inspires tenderness, what happened then to man? Se todo animal inspira ternura, o que houve então com os homens? It is time to rediscover ourselves in nature. Sadly, we are changing the chemistry of the planet. We are changing the biosystems. We are not respecting non-human animals. And I wonder, Professor Cormac Cullinan, where do we go from here? Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Deborah, for, for these pictures and, and for your words. You're always so prepared and so sensitive. It's an honor for us to have you here today. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you. I think we can hear now Professor Vladimir. Are you ready, Professor Vladimir? Welcome once more to our university. Professor 
Professor Vladimir, are you okay? Uh, Professor on, Vladimir, okay. uh, so yeah, the microphone. The microphone. Yes, but I think Jonathan yes. went to speak something. No, 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 no. It's just I was pointing to you that you know Jonathan, the microphone was, we was off. You. We can't hear you. No worries. Oh, okay, okay, okay. It's your turn. Can you hear us? Hello. Okay. I think. Can you hear us now? Is it's everything okay? Yes, yes, yes. I was having some problem with the, the sound, but now it's okay. Let's go. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great joy and honor and a satisfaction that I participate in this interesting lecture, very interesting lecture of this beautiful work developed by Professor Mariana Santiago, to whom I pay my initial tributes. And I'd like to extend a special greeting to all of our participants, and in particular, to my students and colleagues at Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul and Catholic University of Sao Paulo, who are attending this event. I also would like to greet Professor Sinara Lacerda, from the University of Marília, and the coordinator of the Master and Doctor program in law. You can you can hear me? Right. In at this university, Dr. Jonathan Vita. Finally, I will I also want to greet my colleague from the Catholic of São Paulo, Professor Deborah Lembach who gave us a second complete and beautiful lecture and congratulates you uh, for uh, one more time, uh, uh, giving us uh, your best and uh, doing a great job. Thank you. Uh, and finally, uh, our great speaker, professor and lawyer, Cormac Kulinen at the University of Cape Town, South Africa, whom truly speak from the heart. It was with the great curiosity and also joy that I read part of the speaker's book and also some other tests to better understand his reflections, which I anticipate having pleasure, please, a lot, and I hope to contribute to the debate in addition to learning collectively with this beautiful initiative of master and doctor at in law from the University of Marília. Uh, I was with great, uh, in addition, uh, uh, and I hope to complete with this debate, uh, and in this sense, I would like to do some questions to Professor Nakulinen, uh, starting asking, uh, would you like, that I would like to know how you started to be a, uh, how you started to be an uh, uh, environment law uh, professor. Uh, I see your trajectory started in another area, didn't you? Uh, uh, what was the fact, of the moment responsible of this choice uh, or path, uh, uh, how do you change? Uh, how did you uh, observe that uh, this area would be your area? Uh? In your book, Wild Law, if my reading is correct, you propose the recognition of natural communities and eco eco ecosystems as legal persons uh, with rights seeking to the change the relationship with natural world so that exploitation is changing for participation more democratic. I ask how to make this 
recognition né? in practice. How we do this? Now, how does, uh, how does the teacher imagine? Né? How does the professor imagine the representation of these legal entities? Speaking of democracy, would we have an election of these legal entities? John Elkington created the triple, the triple bottom line doctrine né? with this three famous, uh, famous piece né? that is profit, plant, and people, but he does not address governance. In, our, in, in your doctrine, I understand that government has a fundamental role. Né? Would you like, I would like to hear né, about the relevance of governance in earth jurisprudence. The lecture we just uh, had about the jurisprudence, the jurisprudence of the land, né, uh, of the earth, the law is approached as a technique to adapt to environment changes. Uh, would the professor agree that the law here is also a paradigmatic change and the techniques are still under construction, construction, sorry. Or the proposal of the book already presents the transition from the anthropocentric model to the eco uh, model area. Finally, does the title to, of, our book, uh, of your book have a special reason for using the word wild instead of nature or other te uh, terminology. So uh, this is some of, of my doubts and sharing to contribute of our debate today. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very uh, glad to hear uh, all uh, uh, that you uh, built in this uh, at the last years. Congratulations. Thank you, Professor Vladimir. Professor Kulinan, would you like to answer this, these questions for you? Yes, thank you very much for, for such interesting questions. Um, I was very moved by Professor Deborah Lamach's um, presentation just before this. Um, I too grew up on a small um, uh, place outside of town where we had horses. And so I, I grew up with horses myself and I, I love those pictures because I could, they brought back such memories. I could almost smell the sweet breath of the horses um, and uh, I could imagine the joy of those, those children. And I think it was a beautiful illustration of um, what the biologist E.O. Wilson has called biophilia, that we, we, are, we are born with a love of, of other living creatures. And if you see, you can see it with children. If, if, a, if you bring a small child into a room and there's an animal in the room, the child will go to the animal. Um, and I think it's, it's natural and in a way we educate people out of it um, instead of in, in encouraging it. And that, that love um, between all living things, I think, is, is part of what holds the, the universe um, together. And I believe it's a very powerful force and that we work with that force rather than against it. Um, it we are more likely to be, to be successful. And I also liked that the, suddenly seeing the picture of, of the poet Ian McCullum at the, at the end. Um, he, he is a friend of mine in Cape Town, so it was, it was lovely to, to, to see him suddenly appear, appear with the elephant. So, so thank you for that. But it also takes me to the, the, the first question Professor Vladimir asked is, how, how did I end up in this field? So a part of it is definitely that I spent a part of my, my, a large part of my youth, just wandering around in the in the bush in the forest with dogs and horses and, and close to, to animals, and um, without realizing, I think absorbed a, a deep love for, for nature. And both my parents, um, I think, encouraged that. Um, but but then I became um, when I went to university, I was, became involved in student politics and anti-apartheid politics. And um, for a while, I, I moved away from nature, and then I went to a law firm, and I became involved in shipping law, and um, uh, it was a very different world. And, and initially, it was very interesting working in a big law firm and learning, but after a while, I began to feel a slight dissatisfaction. And um, um, I, I began to feel that 
um, there was something I was missing. And I, I, I started thinking about what, if I'm not going to do this, what are my interests really interested in? And of course, the, the answers to um, questions, career questions, if you like, are, are inside. We tend to look in the outside world to, to find them, but the answers are normally inside us. And I realized that one of the, the strongest motivations for my life had been nature. And so I, I've, for a while, I thought of giving up law and, and studying ecology, but then I thought I might end up in, in a white coat in a laboratory somewhere and it, it didn't sound very attractive. And then somebody, an ecologist said to me, you know, we have quite a lot of ecologists, but we don't have lawyers who can under, who understand ecology, who will use the law to protect the environment. And maybe you should go in that direction. And that was a very useful thing. And then I started looking for somewhere to study and there were no courses in South Africa. And anyway, to cut a long story short, I ended up in London working in a commercial law firm, but um, I was in the first class, the first master's class that London University offered in environmental law. And I studied it over two years part-time while, while I was working. And um, for, a, for a long time, I thought that, that I, environmental law was, was where I was going to, how, I was, how one could solve the problems of the world. Um, uh, and, uh, but then I, I ended up working in a lot of countries, particularly working for the United Nations the Food and Agriculture Organization and drafting legislation. And I began to find that there were some problems which I couldn't fix by, with better drafting. You know, I was trying to draft legislation because I thought that would have the biggest impact. But there were some things that um, the problem was deeper and I, I, was, I was worrying about was something to do with the philosophical approaches which lay beneath the law with the, with the world views. And um, I was worrying about trying to work out how to deal with this when I was introduced to, to Thomas Berry and, and, and his work. Um, and that was fantastic because it was like somebody giving me the end of the string and then I could pull on that string and, and, and unravel it. And it, it was really, um, uh, I felt it then combined both my law and my, my, my love of nature. And um, it, it felt, and I think many people have this feeling when you encounter this work, it feels not entirely new. It, it's almost like you recognize something which a part of you already knew. Um, so, so there's a, a deeper sense of, of, of recognition. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's, um, so I suppose that um, without necessarily doing it consciously, I suppose following my heart and not just my brain, or following both my, my mind and my heart simultaneously brought me here. Um, uh, rather than just being intellectual a, a, a about it. And so I would encourage the young people who are listening to, to think about that, to try and follow your, your, who you really are and your, and your in it. And I, I liked what Professor Deborah Thumbach said about, you must speak from the heart, because I, I do believe in, the Buddhists call it heart-mind. It's, 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 it's like using your intellect, but in a capacity in a compassionate and connected way, not in a cold, uh, disengaged way. And it doesn't mean abandoning rationality, it means supplementing rationality with, with something, something more. Um, the, the question, you, the next question was about how do we, would we recognize um, earth communities, ecosystems in, in practice, in, in law? And um, it's, it's a very interesting uh, question. Um, you know, for a while, I, I wondered if one should even use the word rights of nature, because the word rights, as, as you all know, has a long legal history and it comes with a lot of baggage. Uh, it, you know, I was taught that um, our system is, was based on Roman law that um, uh, ubi ius ibi remedium. If there is a, a law or right, there must be a remedy. If there's no remedy, there's no law. So, so if the courts don't give you a remedy, there's no right. And if you apply that, then nature has no rights and it makes, makes no sense. Um, but then I thought, well, if one says that nature has interests, for example, um, it would be less strong than human rights. And, and the idea that humans were, had stronger rights would, would predominate again. And if one tried to move said that humans shouldn't have rights, everybody should have interests, then you would be fighting with the human rights community who should be your allies. 
So I decided that although I think that idea of rights for nature is not perfect, I think that it is um, uh, a good uh, start because it immediately forces one to, it, because it sounds strange to lawyers who've been brought up like we have in the traditional systems, it immediately forces one to consider the holder of those rights as a being, not a thing. Because if nature has rights, then nature in a sense is not an object, it, it is a subject. As Deborah said, the, 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 the communion of subjects, the, um, and it, it raises those kind of, kind of questions. So although you know, some people have, have argued with some legitimacy that we should be focusing on the duties of humans, not the rights of nature. In other words, the duties of humans to nature. And indeed, if you, even if you look at the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth, most of it is about duties of humans uh, rather than the rights of nature. But the, the value of using the rights language is that it forces this, re this uh, recognition of, of the subject. Um, and um, there are many ways, of course, you know, many indigenous cultures don't even have the word rights. They don't use the term, um, and not all cultures have it, but the, the real thing is, is to recognize the other, not as an enemy or some, something to be exploited, but as a fellow earthling, as a fellow member of, 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 of community and to live in, in good community with them. Obviously, legislation has been used to recognize um, uh, legal personality, particularly in New Zealand, um, where mountains and, 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 and rivers have been recognized as, as legal persons, persons in the eyes of the law, legal subjects, if you like. But as you know, also the courts have done it in, in India, in Bangladesh, in Colombia, and of course, Ecuador and Bolivia too. So um, there's more than, than, than one way. And I think also it's quite possible to, in a sense, begin to act in that way, even if the formal legal system does not recognize it. So one of the things the Global Alliance has done is establish the International Rights of Nature Tribunal, which decides cases on the basis that the international the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth is law. Now we understand that it's not recognized by states around the world, but we're saying we're choosing to recognize it as law in order to demonstrate that you would get better outcomes if you applied this law in deciding cases. So if you like, it's a kind of a prototype, it's, a, it's an ex experiment, it's, it's, a, it's a way of developing um, your theory through practice. Um, so, you know, I, but certainly when, when I first heard the idea, when I first heard Thomas Berry suggest that everything should have rights, I was shocked, you know, and I thought, do you realize the trouble that's going to cause, you know, that, that, that giving animal rights is, is controversial enough, um, and, and, and now everything, you know, and it's just, it, I was overwhelmed, and I, and I initially sort of recoiled from the idea, and then I went away and thought about it, and I thought that I'm confusing, um, what is right with what is difficult. In other words, I was saying, because this is difficult, one shouldn't do it. But, but the real question is, is it right or not? The question of difficulty of implementation comes, comes later. And uh, I, I, th I think that if we want to claim that we have inherent human rights because we exist as humans, um, it's illogical and um, ethically wrong to deny it to all the other creatures that have evolved with us. Um, uh, um, you touched on the question of governance, and I, I do agree with you that governance is, is, is critical. Um, if, and by governance, I would mean all the combination of all the factors that um, help guide how humans behave in a society. So it, it could even be religious beliefs, it, it could be institutional structures, law of course is, is, is at the heart of it, but also it, it may be um, mythologies, etc. Et, et but I, I think that the fundamental change is that most governance systems are set up to facilitate and legitimize exploitation and domination. That is the, uh, that is the hidden purpose. And often it's not just for people, it's for a tiny oligarchy, a tiny sector of society that, that it's, it's functioning. It's not even all humans. Um, uh, and uh, so if, our, if we change the purpose of the legal system, um, to say that the purpose is to enable us to be uh, 
good members of this community, responsible members of this community, um, and to promote life and to recognize that life is what flows through us all and connects us all, then, then we could change every aspect of law. We would change company law, we would change tax law, we would change land law, we would change ev everything. Over time, it, it, it wouldn't happen in, immediately. Um, so I do very much agree with you that, that we're at the initial stages of prom promoting paradigmatic change, the change of paradigms, as you say, from, from an from a anthropocentric uh, to an ecocentric. And um, it's quite right, your observation is quite right that, that um, the techniques are still being developed and um, uh, we, are, we have just sketched it it out in the broadest outline and now there's lots of work to be done by lots of people in in the nuts and bolts of how this will work and i don't i think it will also reflect the diversity which we see in nature there will be different answers in different places because the answers need to be culturally specific and they need to be specific to place but of course they still all need to be guided by the, the great jurisprudence how, how the planet works as a whole and the, you also asked me about the, the calling the book Wild Law, which, which, is, a, which I th is an important question because, um, I mean, initial, the initial reaction was people had said, that's a stupid title because wild and law are opposites. You can't, you can't say wild law, it, it, it's, you know, it, it's a, it doesn't make sense. Um, I, I must admit that the first, how it happened initially was, I knew the book was primarily about Earth jurisprudence, but I thought, who's going to buy a book called Earth Jurisprudence? Uh, you know, a few lawyers maybe, but you know, jurisprudence is such a heavy word and such a obscure word, and uh, you know, it, it would be, it would sit on a few library shelves around the world. And so, I, my initial thought was, I need a sexier title, and so I was thinking about, and th and that's where I first went. But after a while, I realized that it was a much more powerful idea because for me, um, wildness is, is it's something about, it's, it's, it expresses a kind of spirit. There's a mysterious force in the universe which is driving evolution and driving this incredible profusion of beauty, et cetera. And it's, it's, its essence is that it's highly creative and it's uncontrollable by humans. It, it's, it's a wild force. And so for me, that wild wildness is what connects us, our natures, our small human natures with the big nature. It connects us with, with all that is, li that is living. And it's, it also communicates that we're not in control, um, that we are, that this flows through us. We, we, are, we, don't, control, we don't control it. Um, and it, and I, I think wildness and the, the quality of, is something really special about this, this planet that we live on. And so wild law is, is any law that would tend to allow that flow of, of vital energy that would um, encourage the flourishing and the flow of life um, rather than uh, constrict it and constrain it and um, uh, tame it if I can put it that way. So I'm very happy that I chose wild law because I think it does express what I feel about it. Um, and and it, it, because it jars when you first hear the words wild and law next to each other, it sounds so strange. It calls into question how we've used law almost primarily as a controlling instrument and often as an instrument of oppression. Sorry, it's a bit of a long answer, but thank you for the interesting questions. Thank you, Professor Vladimir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your answer, Professor Kalinan. Congratulations. Uh, I have a message for you. We have some friends in common that are in the UN summit right now. It's taking place as well. And they announced uh, your lecture here in our university. And this friends, mm -hmm. special, very special friends. Uh, are giving a, a congratulations, special congratulations for you. Oh, so thank you now very much. your lecture will be mentioned in New York. Congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. It's so lovely to, to be making friends around the world in, the, in this way. I, I, I always feel happier when I meet other earth loving people. <laughs> yes, I think it's the best part of our work. Yes. And 
uh, I have a query. I, I would like to, to make myself a question for you because I know uh, you were in the beginning of the project uh, uh, of the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth. And 10 years after that, I would like to know how you feel about the, the consequences, the results, because I'm not so happy with we, what we have now, the political situation, and it seems uh, more difficult than ever to have this declaration being successful. Uh, how do you feel about it? So it's a good, it's a very good question. So um, I, I first, how I got involved was, was um, uh, Pablo Solon, who was um, Bolivia's ambassador to the United Nations at the time of the, the, um, the COP, the climate change COP in Copenhagen, he invited me to speak at a side event there. I, I, in fact, I was very surprised because the, the phone in my office rang and, and, and somebody said, it's the uh, Bolivian Ministry of Foreign Affairs on the phone. And I thought it must be a friend of mine joking because one doesn't expect if you live in Cape Town to be phoned by the, the ministry from Brazil, uh, sorry, from Bol Bolivia. Anyway, um, so they invited me and I asked him, well, why did you invite me? And he said, well, because um, there is this move within the United Nations to portray rights of nature as a strange um, uh, phenomena, which is specific to the Andean cultures of Latin America. In other words, it's a, it's a little cultural um, um, anomaly and we'll keep it in the cultural phase. It's not universal. Um, so they wanted somebody from another place in the world to come and speak with, with him to show that it wasn't just an Andean thing. But he and I became friendly and then that, that summit failed. And then the next thing is um, a few months later, he was on the phone and saying, we need this quickly and can you come and help, help um, draft it. And at that time, when I went to Cochabamba, the idea of, of the Bolivian government was that the conference would produce a draft that would be presented to the United Nations for adoption. Um, but I realized that the United Nations was very unlikely to adopt uh, an, a, anything like that anytime soon. It would be seen as too radical. Um, and so during the negotiation process at the conference, we, we changed the wording so that the preamble says that it is adopted by the people at the conference and it is recommended to the United Nations for adoption. So it exists as a, as a people's document, um, uh, uh, a final people's document, if you like, uh, the product of that outcome, and also uh, as a proposal to, to the United Nations. And I think, and then of course, we set up the, the, the tribunal that I mentioned to implement it. And it turned out that, that it was very important that we did that because as you, you point out, I think you're alluding to the fact that both in Bolivia and in Ecuador, one ended up with governments who, who, who did not, uh, well, I don't think they believed in rights of nature, or well, certainly they, they, they began to act in ways that were not consistent with the rights of nature. And if we had left this initiative solely in the hands of the states, it would have ended it. But fortunately, um, we, we rooted it in civil society. So although I would agree with you, it, the, the progress in shifting uh, states has been slow, um, the progress among civil society has been gaining strength um, and, and continues to do so very rapidly. And now we are beginning to see it entering the mainstream. So for example, at the, in the process of developing the agenda for the next 10 years of implementing the Convention on Biological Diversity, the so-called post-2020 vision, um, it's appearing in some of the working documents. I'm not sure it'll get into the final documents. It's political parties around the world are beginning to adopt it. Um, and um, I think that what will happen is that the most states will resist it. And our, our ambition is to make the political pressure from the bottom, from the grassroots, um, so strong that it'll be difficult to resist. And I think, unfortunately, I think disasters like the pandemics, the, the hurricanes, the fires, et cetera, are going to drive the change um, that people will realize after a while that 
the existing systems won't work and then they'll start demanding change and at that point the the governments may may change so i would agree with you that that the the um at perhaps the international level the, the progress has been li limited and there's been reverses in some countries like bolivia um but um you know, when I started, when Wild Law was published, these ideas were crazy. They were regarded as really, you know, um, uh, not, uh, how should we say, I, I think there's something in Wild Law, which I said, if, you, if you're reading this book in a law firm, you better have a, 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 a cover on it so people can't see what you, you, you're reading. But now, but now they are much more mainstream and they're regarded certainly in the academic world as legitimate ideas for debate, et cetera. So I, I feel that we've made very rapid progress, which is, which is accelerating outside of, of governments. Um, and there has been some penetration into government. So I'm not, I'm not um, uh, despondent about the progress. Although of course, we, none of us are moving fast enough. Um, so I'm not sure that we're going to change in time to to save most people or even save our species. But um, I believe that one must do what you think is right. You can't say you can't give up just because you may not succeed. It's really true. Thank you so much, Dr. Kulinan. And uh, one one more curiosity. Uh, what about uh, the tribunal in Paris? You were president in, in this occasion. And how do you feel? Uh, could it be an instrument for, for being uh, a better work in this, in this area? Do you think a tribunal will be a good choice for defending rights of nature? And, Yes, I mean, I, th I think it. I think it's the tribunal has been very successful, and there've also been regional tribunals. For, for example, I was talking about Bolivia. So, one of the calls from that same conference was there should be a tribunal. They were focusing mainly on climate change, but we decided that we needed one around um, rights of nature more generally. And although it has no official legal status, in other words, it's not recognised by states, etc. We, we decided quite deliberately to, to, to set it up as a, in a way, a challenge to the international law regime. So it's established formally by a people's convention signed by organizations, not states, but organizations from around the world to say, there's nothing in international law which says that you can't do it that way. Um, it's just that it's normally done, the conventional international law is states signing con uh, conventions. And um, recently, there have been hearings in Bolivia about the, the, the fires, and um, the, the, the findings of the tribunal were on the fact that the tribunals went to Bolivia on a fact-finding mission, um, and uh, it was on all the front pages of the newspapers in Bolivia. And this, uh, at the first one was at the time of Evo Morales, and he didn't want to meet with the tribunal, but eventually public pressure forced the government to meet. And then more recently, um, I think there's a, another judgment about to come out about the fires in uh, Chikatania, um, uh, the forests. And um, the, those, the findings are being used by people in real court cases. So you have this interesting thing where some, uh, uh, an institution, a people's institution, which has no formal legal status, is beginning to build sufficient shall we say, moral weight or, or, or um, sufficient legitimacy in the eyes of people that it's forcing its way into the, the mainstream political and, and even possibly the legal system via cases. So, but we're learning all the time with, with using these instruments. We're learning how to refine our thinking, it's, you know, because you have to apply the theory to particular facts. We're learning things that work and don't work. So I, I see it as a very important um, social experiment, um, and I definitely think that it's a very powerful thing also to have a regional one because, I mean, people are often moved to tears when they attend a tribunal because you hear the experts explaining the issue, and then you hear the people who have been directly affected, whose homes have been burnt or they've been affected by fracking, etc., et and, and then you hear the arguments, and so it is an experience which is both intellectual and heart, it's, it's mind and heart, and it's very powerful.
um, and also for communities who come to give evidence there. I didn't realize this before I saw it happen, you know, that people want their day in court to come from a tiny village somewhere where the, a mining company is destroying everything you believe in and to be able to stand up on a platform in Paris, for example, or, or Bonn in Germany um, and, and tell your story to an international audience. Um, uh, some people leave satisfied with just that before anything else. And I didn't realize that uh, that, that effect. So it's also powerful in that sense. So um, in a sense, the tribunals have been even more successful than I, than I thought. And it's taught me that we don't just need laws, we need new institutions to make these things real, which, which goes back to the, the, the point of Professor Vladimir that, you know, it, it's governance in the broader sense, not just law we're talking about here. It's, it's true, Professor uh, Kuliman. And one more question, a last question, please, because it's a so Bye. great opportunity to have you here. And I was talking to you that I'm from Bahia, I was born in Bahia, and Bahia has a, a special connection with Africa. And you are from South Africa, and I know it's really different from other countries in Africa. I've been to some different countries in Africa before. And sometimes, I don't know if it's because I'm, I'm from Bahia, but sometimes I feel a little upset because everything about the rights of nature seems to, to be connected to Andean culture and the idea of when vivir. And I know in Africa, you have something like this, like this idea. And it seems that Africa, it's always forgotten. And I think we can, uh, we can see the, the, the African culture, it's important to this mo movement equally, so equally in the same level to Indian culture. And I see that in, in Asia, we have some concepts so similar to um, like in Bhutan, I don't know how to say Bhutan in English, <laughs> please someone help me. And they have an idea from the happiness that how happiness is important to the, the people and culture. So I don't know if you have the same feeling that I have, but sometimes I would like to, to, to see the African culture being more respected in this point, in this subject. What do you feel about it? I, I agree completely, Marianne, and it, it has been worrying me for some time. So actually, in the past few weeks, I've been engaging in trying to pull, pull together uh, an African hub, hub for the Global Alliance. In other words, pull it together the organizations and communities in Africa who are working on these ideas. Um, and one of the reasons is obviously that we can work better together. But another reason is, is so that the African voice and the African way of thinking can be more uh, present in the international dialogue, as, as you say, be because, because one of the things that is very interesting um, for me, uh, being exposed to some uh, traditional African philosophies is, is, is one of the philosophies which, well, it's quite widespread among many of the different groups is, is the idea that a person, um, you, you sometimes may hear people say, you know, quoting is an African um, proverb that it takes a village to, to raise a child or, or et cetera. But there, there's an expression um, uh, in Zulu, it's Ubuntu, uh, no, sorry, Ubuntu, um, Ngumuntu, Ngabantu. A person is a person because of people. And, and what it means uh, in a philosophical context is that when you are born, you do not have much um, substance as a person. And over your life, you, you build yourself as a person through relationships. So for example, I, I cannot be generous. I cannot become a generous person unless I have relations of generosity with other people. Unless I'm generous to other people, that is how I build myself as a generous person. And people that do this through their lives become, uh, acquire greater sort of substance in a spiritual sense and will become 
powerful and important ancestors that will guide their communities even after life. So the concept of self can only be made through communion or relationship with other. And that's not just with other people, it's also with everything around you. So it's a, it's a beautiful um, concept of how Thomas Berry says it takes a universe to make a child. You know, we, we, it is through our relationships with, with, with animals, um, with people, even with looking up at the stars, the whole universe, all of those shape who we are and make us and that one's life is a process of self-making through these relationships. And that concept fits so beautifully with, with what we're saying because um, you cannot be fully human except if there were no elephants and no wild animals, if there were no forests, etc., it will mean that we cannot become fully human. We cannot, uh, we cannot uh, attain the fullness of humanity um, if we uh, degrade um, our relations, those with whom we relate. Um, and so the idea of of protecting and and uh, everything around us um, becomes a very personal thing. Um, uh, they need us and we need them. And, and without that, it's not possible to attain one's full humanity. The, the pictures of those children with the horses, I think you could just see that something was happening to those children because of that relationship with that, that animal. Um, and uh, those are the kind of philosophies which I think are um, are, are enriching for the world as, as a whole and, and, and our perspectives on this work which which are not yet being heard in the international discussions but hopefully will be as as we get more African organizations to participate. So I, I completely agree with your observations. Thank you Professor Kurinan. Uh, I think that it's the end of this event and I would like to thank you once again, your presence here today is so special for us. Thank you, thank you so much. I hope someday with, uh, in the end of this pandemic times, we can have you in presence in our university in Brazil. I think you should be in Bahia also. And I we can you. organize it because I really think you should be in Bahia someday. And I would like to thank Professor Deborah for her amazing presentation and pictures and for Professor uh, Vladimir for these brilliant questions. As always, they are all, all of them are great friends. It's always a pleasure to have you with us in our university. And uh, I would like to invite my coordinator and friend, Jonathan Vita, to, to the last words to our students. Thank you so much, Professor Kurdina. Thank you very much, Mariana. It was really interesting to understand more about the works as said by Deborah of Professor Kurdinan and also uh, the points made by Professor and friend Vladimir. And I believe that uh, the nature and the taking care of uh, the environment is really the way to go and this project alongside harmony with nature is really important and to to know also that it was quoted on the un uh, discussions today on the un discussions as mariana mentioned it was very very important to either uh, unimar obviously but also to our event and therefore i thank you very much for all, everyone at the table here at Zoom and everyone also watching at YouTube. And don't forget, fr uh, today we have at 6 p.m. another event on methodology and Friday, another one on tax reform in Brazil. Hope to see you, especially on Friday since I'm hosting the event. Thank you very much and take care everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, it was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. So stay in touch, Professor Kulina. Thank you. I'd love to. In Bahia next year. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Nice Thank to meet you. Ciao, pessoal. Ciao, bye -bye. Ciao, Vlad. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Ciao, obrigada. ciao. Obrigada. And my dear students, see you next week. Bye bye. Ciao, ciao, Mariana. Ciao, Vladimir.